is a good biopsy because this is a really important kind of case here. So rather than me telling you what it is, somebody tell me what you guys think it is. Somebody just start describing what we're looking at here. Okay, so I think we're looking at uh, possibly acral skin. It just it's very acanthotic. Uh, that are oh, it could be um, you know, lichen simplex chronicus too. Yeah, just, yeah, good, good, good. Glad you picked that up. Nice, uh, nice reversal there. As you can <laughs> see, there's follicular osteum here. So you got all this thick cornified layer that looks like palm and sole. It it can't be acral skin. So good. It is like in simple product. Okay, but what else is going on? Well, Show there's this canal here in, the, in this unknown session, right? Yeah, there's a well, there's this mostly superficial infiltrate, so, somewhat perivascular, but kind of diffuse as well. Of, okay. Uh, um, what about in this area, for example? I mean, it's more dense there. Okay. You're not, I mean, it uh, looks like it's obscured a little bit, the um, dermal epidermal junction. Yes, very good. Good, good. Ex excellent. They did a shave biopsy now. Uh, why do you think they did a shave? Mm. And let's be, let's be kind to the biopsier <laughs> as opposed to being uh, critical of the biopsier in this case. Maybe they thought it was some sort of neoplasm a growth. Yeah, yes, yes. A good dermatologist would obviously never do a shave biopsy of an inflammatory skin disease. So they thought this was probably a neoplasm. Okay. So what do you think it might have looked like clinically? Uh, well, hyperkeratotic. Yeah. <laughs> yes, hyperkeratotic, verrucous. It's got this papillomatosis, it's got acanthosis. So it probably looked verrucous. What do you think their clinical diagnosis might have been? Uh, maybe an SK or a wart. Okay. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Pretty good deep biopsy. Uh, like there's an SK. Uh, well, you may, but, but you're not. Are you going to shave a deep shave of parigo if you see the patient in the clinic? If you really think it's parigo? Mm, probably not. No, you just look at him clinically. He got parigo. We're going to give you you know, medications for that, this new CD31 inhibitor or something like that. Uh -huh. So maybe they thought it was a cancer. Yeah, they probably thought it was a cancer. And which kind of cancer do you think they thought it probably was? That's the uh, squamous. Yeah, squamous cell. That's very important in this case because that actually is a very common minute clinical miscue. And if they take a superficial shave biopsy, sometimes it is diagnosed incorrectly as squamous cell carcinoma. But we know here it's not squamous cell, right? Right. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't look like it. No. So what what's you you, you mentioned this infiltrate here? Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at a little higher magnification. You said it's obscuring the dermal junction, which is correct. What else do you see in this field just right here? Are these like thin reedy ridges, elongated? Excellent. What do we call those thin, elongated reedy like this? Uh, is it like sawtooth? Is that yes. sawtooth? Good. Sawtooth. See what you've learned so far in your first six months of dermatology? You learned <laughs> a, a, a cliche sawtooth reedy. <laughs> and where do you see that? What disease do you see that in? Uh, like in plainness. Okay, what else is, is here? Uh, the hypergranulosis. Yeah, what's the shape of the hypergranulosis? Oh, here? like a wedge shape. Wedge shaped hypergranulosis, hyperkeratosis, wedge shaped uh, the sawtooth epidermal reedy, mm -hmm. lichen infiltrate. So, what's the diagnosis? Uh, like it's lichen planus, but could you call it like hypertrophic? Or... Yeah, very good. This is hypertrophic lichen planus. That's exactly what this is. And notice, and these are, this is a, and the reason I sort of went through all this stuff at the beginning is that that's a very common error that clinicians make when they see hypertrophic lichen planus. They think it's a squamous cell. There may be a relatively small number of lesions, and they're verrucous and hyperplastic, and they've got all the thick cornified layers. So, you know, clinicians say, hmm, that looks like it might be like a squamous cell or a KA. 
uh, take a, a, a biopsy. This one, they took a good deep saucerization biopsy, so we're able to make a definitive diagnosis here. But if they just took a superficial biopsy and maybe there's some pseudocarcinoma hyperplasia, we see these lesions not uncommonly get misdiagnosed as squamous cell, usually when they take a superficial biopsy. But something like this is pretty straightforward. And then they end up uh, getting Mohs surgery. And what's one of the most common locations for this lesion? I mean, I think the, the wrists or the... the well, that's the classic the... location for LP. You're right. The, you know, the, the flexural areas, the wrists, those locations. Well, what's the most common location of hypertrophic lichen planus, interestingly enough? Not where you would commonly think. Yeah, I don't think I'm, I know that. Okay, good, good answer. Um, the pretibial area. Oh, very okay. common location, often in older individuals, often in, in often older women, interestingly enough. And so when you see somebody that comes in with these verrucous lesions, sometimes they're KA, sometimes they're parigo, sometimes they're this. So just make sure that you don't miss the diagnosis. And, you know, you may think it's a cancer, but if, just make sure if you do think it's a cancer, if you take a deep enough biopsy, that you will not just erroneously take something up in this area that ends up getting called a cancer. I've seen that happen many times over the years. I mean, this one over here almost looks more like a severed keratosis, you know, because that's just a little more superficial. So you really almost needed the central lesion to make the diagnosis in this case. Okay, good. Excellent. That's an important case too, by the way, because, you know, you'll, you'll see that in the real world. Okay. Different animal here, but one we can still do. I'll go to the middle one. It's got a nice section here so anybody want to do this one i'll try this one um okay so we have a either shave or excision good obviously. very good yeah whenever they kind of get out of the fat like that you've done shaves now mm -hmm. yeah it doesn't get this deep so. Yeah, it's pretty hard to get that. And notice also it's got a nice sort of squared sort of uh, shape. So probably this was lab that sort of sectioned it like that. So good. Probably an excisional biopsy. Um, you know, and... One reason to do that kind of thing is it kind of gives you an idea of what the clinician was thinking about, you know, when they took a biopsy. So if they did something like this. They're probably saying, wow, you know, this thing looks pretty big and Maybe it's cancer, you know, maybe we just cut the whole thing out, or maybe they had a previous shave and then somebody recommended re-excision. So it just kind of gives you an idea of what the clinician was thinking. Yeah. <clears throat> um, from this power, it looks like it's probably neoplastic. Um, okay. Good. Um, it's pretty well circumscribed and symmetric. Um, Good. Very good. Yeah, look at that nice round sort of edge to it. You can really kind of draw a little circle right around that. And inflammation over here, I mean, if that's part of the same thing, it certainly doesn't look really poorly circumscribed. Nice flat bottom to it, too, a round bottom to it. So I, I totally agree. Okay. And um, as far as cells, it's a little lighter. So I'm going to go with neutrophils or histiocytes. Okay, good. Very, very good. Yeah, I, I agree with you. These are pale cells. That's great that you can recognize that at low magnification. What about these cells over here? Where? Oh, over there. Um, yeah, so those are those are a little darker. So maybe lymphocytes over there. Good. Very good. So we've got an area here that's got these this aggregation of these pale cells. We think they may be histiocytes. And then we've got these other cells over here that certainly look more like, you know lymphocytes, maybe some other kind of cells, inflammatory cells. So maybe it's a neoplasm that's inflamed. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, you said histiocytes, and you said you thought it was neoplastic. If it's histiocytes with neoplasm, what are you thinking about? Um, like a granulomatous? Well, that wouldn't be a neoplasm. No, it's more of inflammatory. Um... But, it, but you do see neoplastic processes that have a lot of histiocytes in them. And they may be benign neoplasms, where they're really neoplastic or sort of a quasi-neoplastic inflammatory condition. But what, 
what's the general sort of disease in general that gives you like a, a lots of histiocytes, but it's kind of considered in the neoplastic sort of family of things? Um, it's kind of a little hard question to answer, but um, you know, things like the non ex histiocytoses, like for example, Jules um, Anaconda, you know, those kind of things. So those are sort of quote neoplasms in a way they're they're really of inflammatory cells it's kind of a way to think about it so it might be something along those lines could it be something other than histiocytes here um yeah yeah it could be um i don't want to spend too much time on it but just briefly what if you see something that's kind of clear at low magnification it's benign looks kind of maybe epithelioid, you say, well, there could be histiocytes. What's well, another thing that it could possibly be where the cells look kind of clear like this at low power? I mean, well, it, could st like, it could it still be like, sorry? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you a clear cell hydratinoma or something like that at low power. So but I know spend a lot of time yeah. on that, but I agree with everything you've said so far. So let's go to higher magnification. And you've already seen this probably in advance. So now that we look at it, are we right or are we wrong? Um, so they're they don't look like histiocytes. They don't? Sorry, hold on, let me zoom in. That's real quick. Um Okay, you yeah, they are histiocytes. You, don't, you do or you don't think they're histiocytes? I think they're histiocytes. Yeah, you're right. They are histiocytes. Good. Okay, let's look at the other cells, too, that we saw at low power. And let's see what these cells are. Can you tell what these cells are? A lot of them are lymphocytes, like you said, but notice that some of them have got this little clock face nucleus and this little paranuclear. Yeah, the plasma cells. Yeah, they're plasma cells. There's a whole lot of plasma cells in here. And you almost get kind of almost like a little starry night kind of appearance over here a little bit. Lots of dark cells with these pale cells in the middle of it. Is there anything else about these histiocytes that you noticed? Where are these plasma cells and some of these lymphocytes? Now, clearly, some of them are sitting out here in the in the dermis, but let's look at what about some of these, like that one, and these over here. Where are they located? Inside of the histiocytes. Okay. What's that phenomenon called? Is it imperial poesis or something like that? <laughs> Peripoesis. Yes. Imperipoesis. And what does that mean? Um, I mean, it makes me think of Rosai Dorfman. Good. It should make you think of Rosai Dorfman. And that's what the answer is here. Um, so this is cutaneous Rosai Dorfman. Is that no. what you thought before I pointed all that stuff out to you? No. No. I mean, it <laughs> it it definitely didn't come to my my mind until we went through it, but Okay, good, good. So now you've seen it. It's a nice example of it. I mean, it's really beautiful. Um, there's several different sort of histologic patterns of this. Sometimes you get lots of these cells. Sometimes you get relatively few cells with a lot more plasma cells and lymphocytes, kind of like this half of it over here. Um, now, let's say you wanted to kind of prove that it was Rosai Dorfman. Is there any stain that you might do here for these histiocytes? Um, I knew this at some point. Um, is it like C S one hundred or C? Yep, that's it. S one hundred. That's that's actually that's absolutely correct. S one hundred protein is positive for these cells. If you do C D one A. Negative. You know, it's kind of interesting because you know S100 protein is positive for Langerhans cells as as CD1A, but CD1A is not positive on these cells. These, these cells are kind of a special histiocyte that's S100 protein positive, but not 
demonstrating the CD1A stain for Langerhans cells. So it's really pretty classic for this entity. It's benign, you know, it's not really a lymphoma. It's thought to be some kind of a reactive lymphoid, histiocytoid kind of process. And, you know, a lot of times these things can be large, you know, lobular aggregations and large numbers of lesions. So they can kind of be a problem. Usually it occurs in the lymph nodes, but there are cases it occurs just in the skin. Okay, that's great. Good, good work. All right, this is a very nice one here that's... I can take this, please. On your board exam. So welcome to the boards. This is going to be on there. Can you hear me? All right, so it's like we have a punch biopsy here and kind of working our way top down. There's a nice basket weave, orthokeratosis at the top. Um, the rest of the epidermis looks relatively um, normal, and then just below the epidermis looks like we have an area that um, is uninvolved, what I would say would be consistent <coughs> with a grenzone okay. in the superficial dermis. And then looking just below the grenzone, it, it seems there's an inflammatory uh, infiltrate of some good. type. Okay, I very see. good. And tell me about the distribution of that infiltrate here. So it's um, fairly consistent throughout the upper portion of the dermis and the biopsy yeah, that we I have. Agree. Good. Can you tell at low power? This is where you separate the the adults from the children. We used to say <laughs> That's not politically correct anymore. So we're going to say the adults from the children, from the from the dermatologist, from the non-dermatologist. How about that? What's the cell type here? From this power, it has. This is where you really, this is where you earn your your uh, medal of honor. If you can do if you do <laughs> this power, <laughs> you can say right. what they're uh, not. Right? You can say what they're not. What are they probably not going to be? Well, it looks basophilic, so. Uh, that last case, I, you tell a low power, there were a lot of plasma, well, it was a lot of, of uh, lymphocytes, and, and we said, well, there might be some plasma cells in there. What about here? Do you think these are mostly lymphocytes, or do you think they're some other kind of cell? I think it's a, um, a mix. Good. Yeah, these are not all lymphocytes, because they're not all small black cells. Good. And if you uh -huh. really look hard, you can see there's some kind of reddish color in here. Right. There might be some EOs. There might be some extravasated red cells. So those are all just mm -hmm. kind of. And you're right. Notice this is kind of targeting the blood vessels, <laughs> and, uh, dermis, and the just beneath the papillary dermis between the blood vessels and targeting these blood vessels down here. So mm -hmm. Superficial, probably mid to deep, mostly perivascular infiltrate with other cells and lymphocytes, but a higher magnification. And now. What kind of cells are we looking at here? I do see some of those eosinophils that we just talked about. And then there, there are also these. Cells. But what are the main types of cells here? Um, I can find an area down here. It's even better down here. Beautiful area right over here. And you see they've got these kind of bi or trilobe little nuclei there. And then you've got these little yeah, small, tiny, tiny fragments of cells here. Mm -hmm. So There are some EOs, but they're mostly other cells here. Not basophils? Not basophils. We hardly ever see those in dermatology. <clears throat> But look at these right here. Mm-hmm. Neutrophils. 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 Excellent. So we've got a mostly vascular, perivascular mm -hmm. infiltrate with neutrophils and also these teensy tiny dots here. What are those mm -hmm. called? Uh 
Uh, <laughs> Somebody's giving us. Some, I'm not sure. You got a caddy there or somebody, or like a lawyer that's whispering in your ear? <laughs> Nuclear dust. Yes. Uh, what's what's the other name for that? The, the Greek name for it, or Latin, or, or Latin name for it. I think it's Greek. You know what it is. Because you know the name for the disease. We say it all the time. The reason we say it is because we see this stuff here. Yeah, yeah. All right. That my more uh, senior co residents are saying like a leukocyte. Yes, leukocytoclasia. Leukocytoclasia. Okay. <laughs> okay. What's going on with these blood vessels here? There's definite areas of fibrosis. But it's actually fibrin deposition. You see okay. that pink material here? That pinkish stuff right there? That's mm -hmm. fibrin. Now, why is that fibrin there? What's going on there? So now you got to go back to your medical school days. What's the pathophysiology <laughs> of this disease we're looking at here? What's the answer? What's the diagnosis? So uh, with the eosinophils, I was thinking either granuloma facial versus um, erythema elevatum dinutum. Well, those are usually, now this could theoretically be a super, super early lesion of those conditions because what is EED and what is granuloma facial? What, what actually is that entity? The leukocytoclastic. It's a form of leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Okay, so we always say LCV, right? You say that when you see patients in the clinic come with palpable purple in the lower legs, say, ah, leukocytoclastic vasculitis, uh -huh. right? Well, uh -huh. and granular facialis is a form of vasculitis. And if you get it really, really early, it looks like this. But by the time you diagnose it clinically and they got the plaques and the nodules, it's a dense, diffuse infiltrate with lots of inflammation around many blood vessels with fibrous tissue that actually forms around the blood vessels. You really do get fibrosis in that condition. So this wouldn't uh -huh. be a classic example of either EED or that. You do get EOs in garden variety leukocytoclastic vasculitis, though. You do get that. So, so don't say that just because it's there, it can't be that, because you do see some EOs. Now, this doesn't have very many eosinophils, but we commonly uh -huh. see eosinophils in, in HSP, Vasculitis associated with lupus, drug-induced vasculitis, any kind of vasculitis. And why? What's the pathophysiology? What's causing that fibrin deposition? Is it the, the perivascular uh, inflammation? Well, there is. That's Yeah, that's, pro that's part of it. But why is all this here? Why is the leukocytoclasia there? Why are the neutrophils there? Why is the fibrin form? Why do the blood vessels get damaged? What's going on here? Did this just kind of happen because the patient just was unlucky or what's, <laughs> what's, what's, the, what's going on with this thing? Uh, uh, I guess I'm not sure. Well, it's basically an immune complex mediated process, right? They get sure. antibodies antibody antigen reaction, deposits in the blood vessels, complement gets, you know, complement cascade gets induced, complement deposits, it, it causes mm -hmm. fiber deposition, so that whole cascade of things gets going, recruits neutrophils, come in, they get broken down, you get leukocytoclastic vasculitis. And there's lots mm -hmm. of diseases that can cause it. The most common is HSP, so we do immunofluorescence, looking for what what do we look for when we do looking for HSP? Oh, goodness. We haven't gotten to this chapter yet, so I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Does anybody know? IgA. IgA. We look for IgA. So if we did an immunofluorescence on this and, it, and we were lucky enough to catch it within the first 24 hours of the disease developing, the IgA deposited in these blood vessels. The IgA is actually a direct 
uh, neutrophil keeps acting, so you really don't even have to have a lot of other complement that gets deposited, although it, it does get deposited too. But we often mm -hmm. see uh, see this with IgA vasculitis, and, and if you get like a, a separative vasculitis with lots of polys, you should be thinking of IgA vasculitis. You wanted to bet an intern it's on the ward if it's a pustular vasculitis. It's almost always related to IgA. You know, and they often get kidney disease too, so you have to rule that out. So it's a beautiful example of leukocytoclastic vasculitis here. Okay. This is on your board. They will ask you those kind of questions. They will show you a pathology of this somewhere. So you, this is going to be, there may be three to four, five questions about this. So make sure you know all about vasculitis. Okay. All right, good. Thank you. Now we have something that's interesting. Before I call on you again. <laughs> I can try. <laughs> All right. Give a small little punch. Good. And maybe like some kind of little shave floating off to the top right. Yeah, we're going to forget about that. <laughs> okay. All right, so I mean, it looks like it's Great inflammatory. Example. Good, inflammatory. What's yeah, the it's like diffuse, diffusely deep in the dermis. Nodular and diffuse. Yeah. Everything pretty much is involved here. Now, the last person, I didn't see what her name was, made a nice observation of the this area. The Gren zone. Yeah. What's Gren's mean, by the way? I thought it was someone's name. No, it's actually not someone's name, interestingly enough. It's the German word for frontier. And it kind of re refers to like what that really means is like an area that's kind of uninvolved. So let's say you've got a, two armies here. They're going to attack each other. The Grin Zone is kind of the uninvolved area between. It's kind of the no man's land in World War One, you know, where they had trenches over here for the Allies and the Axis powers over here. The Germans are here and the Allies are over here. So this is no man's land. It's where there's no inflammation between it. So it's not it's not anybody's name. And you talk, you hear Grin's therapy, Grin's ray for X-ray therapy. That's where it goes. It just penetrates that far. It didn't go any deeper than that. Oh. So we've got a dense, diffuse infiltrate. What kind of cells? Lymphocytes. Probably a lot of lymphocytes, but we may have some other cells here too. So that's kind of a little bit less black yeah. over here. Okay. So our differential is still pretty broad. Let's yeah. go to higher magnification. And now what kind of cells do you see? Some histiocytes in there? Uh, there might be a few, but there's a lot of other cells, too. Uh, I see some eosinophils. Eos. What about these cells? Neutrophils. Neutrophils. Maybe even a little bit of nuclear dust in here again. Yeah. What about this structure? A blood vessel. Blood vessel. What about the... Tissue right adjacent to the blood vessel. Uh, looks like it's inflamed. <laughs> like it's inflammation. It's got, it's collagen bundles around it, kind of forming this. Yeah. Almost, it's kind of becoming a little fibrotic around the blood vessel. Okay. Let's look at another area over here. Look at this blood vessel. That's actually got inflammation in the wall of that blood vessel. Okay. Here we've got that same inflammation again. There's a sebaceous cell, sebaceous lobule. Most of the dermis is kind of replaced by inflammation, but we do have, it's certainly a hair-bearing area, and there's sebaceous lobules. Let's say this came from the face, for example. What's your differential diagnosis? Good question. <laughs> um, was it like fibrosis around the blood vessels? 
that's one finding here that you can see that's developing in this case. If we if we saw that, let's say we took this biopsy maybe a month later, this might be prominent fibrosis and the inflammation might be somewhat less, but you might see lots of blood vessels with fibroplasia surrounding it, surrounding them. Because that's one of the things that happens with this condition when it's more chronic. Hmm. But forget about that for a minute. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. That's the fuse infiltrate with neutrophils, EOs, some histiocytes, no germinal centers, a grin zone. It's not wedge shaped, so it's not like a bite that turned into a pseudo lymphoma. So, what kind of things do you think about here with the neutrophils and the nuclear dust and the EOs and some of the inflammation inside the blood vessel walls in some areas? Like another vasculitis? Another vasculitis. Does this look like the last vasculitis? No. No. No, this is a dense nodular infiltrate with vasculitis on the face. Any idea what we might be dealing with? Weird that it's on the face. Well, that has to do with the name of the diagnosis. Is it? Well, I think you said in the last one, like granuloma faciale. Yeah, that's what this is, actually. But you don't really see the granuloma. Aha! There we have it. One of the wonderful things in dermatology that has got an absolute misnomer to it. Oh. <laughs> Why do you think it was called granuloma faciale when they first diagnosed this back in the 1800s or whatever? Is that you what it looks like on the face? Clinically? It looked like a granuloma on the face. They, they thought it was tuberculosis. You know, back in the 1800s, everything was tuberculosis because everybody had tuberculosis. And a lot of people had, had it back in those days. So they get tuberculids. They used to think sarcoid was, was tuberculosis. Anything that occurred on the skin, they were just called granuloma. And it didn't mean histologic granuloma. It meant clinically. It looked kind of like a granule. So they call it granuloma. It's just a generic term. So these, these people would come in with these, you know, brownish, plaques on the face, one or two lesions usually with podorange morphology to them, the big dilated follicularosity on their face. And they say, oh, that looks like a granuloma. It's like another, you know, maybe it's no tuberculosis case. And then they biopsy, look at it, and they just kind of described it. Well, now we know that it's not granulomatous at all. It's a form of chronic vasculitis that gives you a nodular dense infiltrate with this pattern, with neutrophils, with EOs, with perifollicular fibrosis. And if you take the same exact histology and transplant it on the hand, what do we call it there? Histologic identical twin, basically. Just like we have histologic identical twins between pemphigoid and pemphigoid gestationis. Well, we got a histologic identical twin between this and one other disease that was also mentioned in the last discussion. Anyone remember? Nobody knows. Was it was it EED? Yes, it was EED. EED looks just like this. It's basically it's not exactly the same, but it's about ninety percent the same histology as granuloma faciale. So you don't call it granuloma faciale in somebody's hand, you know, if it's got the same histology, you call it EED. And then sometimes you'll even see cholesterol clefts in that condition. It's used another diagnosis for that is extracellular cholesterolosis, interestingly enough, because they get cholesterol clefts in EED. You don't usually see that in, in GF. This is a beautiful example of GF. The differential diagnosis is like a pseudolymphoma, but you don't get neutrophils in pseudolymphoma and you don't get the vascular involvement in pseudolymphoma. Okay, so now you've seen two different types of vasculitis, a more chronic one and then a more acute one. Okay, good. All right, okay. more. All right I'll jump in. Looks yeah. like we have a deep punch down to the subcutaneous tissue. Good. Fat. 
There's not a whole lot going on uh, on the top. Looks like all the action is going to be uh, pretty deep. But probably I see some hemorrhage. I think it's uh, uh, from the uh, procedure itself and unrelated to the pathology here. Exactly. Uh, kind of looks like the dermis looks pretty bland overall. I don't really see a whole lot going on. It looks like normal eccrine structures and uh, vascular structures. But down deep, uh, there's an infiltrate uh, that's present. It looks like mostly lymphocytes. And then I see some uh, histiocytes with uh, some giant cell formation. Good. Now, one of the things about... It looks like it's pretty much a so what's, what's, the overall, what's the overall pattern we're looking at here? Uh, this looks like a, like a paniculitis. Good, good. The, okay, so now so you, you basically put it in into one silo. So you're one of the categories of, of, of paniculitis. You've already described some of the inflammation. So when you see paniculitis, what's the how do you approach it? What's your what's your how do you do it? What's your what's the first step that you normally just, generally try to do? Kinda, paniculitis. I just try because it's you can actually it's pretty formulaic. You know paniculitis. Yeah. There's really only about four or five different ways that it goes. So it's actually not as hard as, as one would think. Sometimes it gets difficult if there's secondary change to it, but overall, if it shows pretty good pattern like this, you can make the diagnosis pretty quickly. Yeah, so first I would, you know, look, is it primarily septal or is it primarily lobular? Perfect, very and good. And then I'll look at maybe the, what the uh, infiltrate cell type is. Okay. What else do you look for, too? It's kind of an initial sort of finding. The infiltrate is important. You're exactly right. But what else do we kind of look for to see whether it's present or absent when we get our biopsy of paniculitis? Present or absent. Um, I think also you might get some clues from, like, if the, if, the, if, any, if there's any vascular involvement. Good. Yes, exactly. So we say, okay, is it septal or lobular? Is there vasculitis or not? Because you can get septal purely with vasculitis. You can get lobular <coughs> no, not purely, but mostly with vasculitis. Okay. So if you see like, say, lobular with lots of fat and across with vasculitis, boom, you've got nodular vasculitis slash erythema neurotic. If you see septal mostly with vasculitis with minimal involvement in the lobules, Boom, you've probably got polyarteritis nodosa or possibly migratory thrombophlebitis. So that's how it works. You can really go from the pattern to whether some of these things are present to almost a specific diagnosis pretty quickly if you know the, the, uh, the general approach. Now here, do we have any vasculitis? Um, I didn't, when I looked at it earlier, I did not really appreciate any. Good, there's none, there's none. There's two reasons for that. One is that it's just not present. The other is that maybe they didn't sample it. And that's one thing with some of these paniculitides, when they take a punch, if they're really looking for a larger blood vessel, you may have to take an incisional biopsy. But here, we're gonna presume this is totally representative, and therefore there's no vasculitis. So we've got a septal mostly paniculitis. You said there were some lymphocytes, but you also said there were some histiocytes. And lo and behold, higher magnification, absolutely histiocytes, multinucleated histiocytes. And they're located right adjacent to the septa, which are markedly thickened. What's the th normal thickness of a normal septum? Uh, I'm going to say thinner than that. Better than that. <laughs> it's almost like a small thin string. So when it's like pretty thick and ropey, wow, that's way thicker than it should be. So you know that's, that septum was probably even more inflamed than it is now. So this is kind of a later stage of this process. So what do we, yes. what's the diagnosis here? The most likely diagnosis, we've got a septal paniculitis with granulomatous inflammation in a periseptal location like this with minimal lobular involvement. Yes, uh, um, erythema nodosum. Yes, erythema nodosum. So this is more chronic. This is, yes, more chronic, exactly. This is right down the middle of the fairway. I mean, this is an easy, slam dunk, quick diagnosis that you'll also probably see this on the board examination. It's absolutely fair. Any dermatology resident should get this right. It's really not challenging. And if, when you see this pattern, you should be able to make the diagnosis with certainty. Now, we like to play this game of saying, well, okay, it looks pretty obvious to us. 
you know, the board wants to make it a little bit of a challenge to us. So what are going to, if we're going to make a multiple choice question, what are going to be some of the things we might put down to try to trick a non uh, seasoned, non aware examining? So let's say we look down there and they've got sarcoidosis. Why is this unlikely to be sarcoid? Well, I'm not, um, I think it's more scleroid. Sarcoid tends to be, well, it's granul, you have naked granulomas. Uh, I think it's more, usually going to be higher up. You're going to have some dermal usually involvement. Usually, if you see sarcoid, a couple things. Number one, you don't really get a septal involvement. Usually, get these nodular aggregations of the large epithelioid granulomas with minimal lymphocytic infiltration, you know, present in primarily the lobbies. So, that's not really a periseptal process. And that's, so that's one thing. And also, as you noted, this does have some lymphocytes. It's got some multinuclear histiocytes. So it's not really sarcoidal. It's just, it's you know, weakly sarcoidal. So the septal involvement is a clue here. And this is what's called Miescher's radial granuloma. They're probably not going to ask that, but that's actually what the term is for these periseptal granulomas here. What if they put... Um, the erythema neurotum. And we know that has granulomatous inflammation in it. Does this look anything like that? I think you tend to have um, more, it's maybe more neutrophilic uh, yeah. and maybe a vas some vasculitis present, vasculitis. maybe some initiating necrosis. And that's mostly lobular. You do get granulomatous inflammation in that, but that's mostly lobular. Um, so if they put any kind of sarcoidal thing down here, like maybe zirconium or foreign body or anything like that, those don't localize right here to this thick septa. This is really almost virtually pathognomonic when you see this kind of pattern like this. So don't let any of those things fool you. Just because they're going to put some other granulomatous things down there, don't fall for it. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, very good. Excellent. All right, this is a good one here. You don't see this very frequently. That's why we sort of have a funky little slide here, but that's a good example of this. It's just a little theme this morning. Yeah, so, um, so it appears if we have a punch biopsy, here we have fairly vascular weeds, trichordium up top, uh, normal epidermis, a little bit of an. Yeah, where's the pathology here? Where's the path here? Um, like, as in, like, where where's the action at? Where are we looking at? I would say. Yeah, where, uh, where's the action going on here? Data, <laughs> this is normal. So you don't have to waste any time with that. You say the epidermis no, is normal, no. normal. But this is normal. Right. So uh, in sub-Q. Yeah. So what are we dealing with again? Oh, yeah. yeah. I would say it's more of a, like a paniculitis as well. Yeah. So, so yeah. we're once again in the paniculitis category. And we just talked about the approach to the paniculitis a second ago. So is this right. septal or lobular this time? Uh, I would say it's more... Lobular. I mean, we don't yeah. really see. Yes. Septum. We talked about what's a normal normal septal thickness. Well, here you go. Doesn't that look about like a string? Very, very thick. It does. Yeah, so that's what that's normal. So the septum, septa here are perfectly normal. So this is lobular paniculitis. Okay. Is there vasculitis here? Uh you can see any blood vessels. Yeah. So now I don't see very many. I just see some capillary stuff here. So sure as heck doesn't look like there's any vasculitis, right? No. So now we're dealing with a mostly lobular paniculitis with no vasculitis. Okay, let's go to higher magnification. And let's see if we see anything here. Ah. Now, what do you see? Uh, so we see just kind of this uh, kind of uh, like burning along that adipocytes or like they kind of looks like a little bit of a crystallization 
in there within the... Yes, very good. So you're seeing crystals within the lipocytes. Crystals. What in the world causes crystallization of the fat? And then you get secondary uh, silic infiltrate. Now, this is another one right. they might come on the exam to try to trick you as well. <laughs> so when we see these things, we kind of think subcutaneous fat, necrosis of the newborn, or like a sclerosis, you know, or even very, uh, like very, very steroid. Good. good, good. Can you tell those two apart logically, by the way? Um. Well, I mean, I think sclerema neonatorum <clears throat> has a little bit less inflammation, but but I'm sure that could the be difficult. The answer is no. The answer is generally no. So don't, don't worry about that. But, in fact, I personally believe the two are the same disease. And one of them is just less severe than the other one. One of them tends to come and go and it's gone away. The other one tends to be more serious and associated with calcium abnormality and, can, and patient, the, the kids can die. It's probably... One's just got more of this than the other one. What What is this stuff? What are these crystals? Now, that could be on the exam. They might ask you why these things are crystallizing here. It's not normal for this to crystallize. It's like we have like new calcification. Well, it, it does have some secondary possible dystrophic calcification here. I will agree to that. But why? What's actually causing the crystallization of, of this fat. Why is it crystallizing? Um, I mean... If you did a chemical analysis of this fat versus your fat, what's this fat going to show? I'm not why... I'm not quite, sure. Not, uh, quite uh, sure. That's okay. That's fine. It's actually got palmitic acid. Palmitic acid, which is actually at low temperature, will crystallize in the skin like this. So kiddos that are born that have a higher concentration of palmitic acid in their light in their lipid, as opposed to, you know, normal triglycerides and other things like that that we have. You know, kids are having been eating McDonald's, right? They've been you know, basically living off their mother's serum. And so sometimes the fat composition is different and it's got palmitic acid in here. And, and in some kids, it's just got more than others. And if it's got a lot of it, it'll crystallize when they get cold. And so that's why it's often seen on the back. You know, the kids come out, they maybe they're sitting on their stomach, it's cold in the ICU or whatever. And, and then that's why you want to keep those kids warm. And sometimes it will crystallize like this. Sometimes trauma can induce it. And the, the, the neutrophilic infiltrate is totally secondary. So this is, you can't really tell the difference. So this is one of the crystalline paniculitides. There's only a few of these. So there's this, there's sclerema, there's post-corticosteroid induced secondary crystalline paniculitis like this. Sometimes you people on high dose steroids and they come off of it relatively quickly. Sometimes they can get crystallization of their fat in that situation, get a similar phenomenon. And one, one sort of trick question here, what's one thing that, they might throw on the exam to try to fool you that these kind of look a little bit like ghosts of fat cells. They're, they've got a little bit of calcium in there, but they don't have the crystals. So what, what might they try to fool you? Yeah, they might put pancreatic paniculitis on there. But pancreatic paniculitis doesn't give you the crystals. Looks different. That's saponification. Soap. These are different. So just make sure you can recognize the difference between those two. Let's get through one more and then we'll do the next one on the next conference because the reason I want to show you this one is because they had this. This was the first slide on my board examination way back in the 1980s before any of you guys were born. They showed us this slide. I looked at it and said, oh, wow, that's going to be an interesting exam. They're showing an interesting lesion. And then the second slide was mollusca. So why did I study for hours for this? They showed me mollusca contagiosa at any First year medical student can diagnose. So <laughs> they do show easy things on the board also. So we got five minutes. Who wants to do this one in four minutes? I can try this one. Good. Um, 
So it looks like we have kind of a, well, an excisional biopsy. Yeah, or maybe a, a biopsy. They probably, they probably thought this was maybe a subcutaneous nodule. They took a, they took a little slice over it and it just kind of shelled out of here. Okay. Um, yeah, it looks like a well-encapsulated um, tumor, mainly composed of adipocytes. Good. So what's the diagnosis? What's the diagnosis? <laughs> I mean, so you're thinking about fatty, fatty tumors. Um, I think it's benign or malignant. Looks like it's benign. And okay, so what's the diagnosis just in general, the general family of diagnosis? Benign, lipoma. fat, lipoma, some kind of lipoma. But it looks a little weird for lipoma, doesn't it? It does. It does. Normal, regular old fat cells, are they? These are, but then you got these <clears> other <throat> them that are not. Yeah. <laughs> so what's going on with these cells? Are, are those called mulberry cells? cells? Mulberry, okay. What's a mulberry cell? Remember the old nursery rhyme? Uh, uh, I know they're seen in hibernomas and uh, liposarcoma. But are they composed of uh, brown fat cells? Right, exactly. So that's the diagnosis. Okay. Hibernoma. So that's exactly hibernoma. Okay. Hibernoma. And so, what are the little mulberry internal structures here? What What are those? Like I'm not quite sure. Okay, I'll tell you what they are. They're mitochondria. There's gazillions okay. of mitochondria here, and so this is brown <clears throat> fat. It's a neoplasm of brown fat. And just like kiddos have, these are seen more commonly in children, but they can be seen in adults too. And the brown fat with all these mitochondria, kids have a lot of brown fat. We don't have as much brown fat. So when a kid gets cold, rather than their fat just kind of insulating them, they actually produce heat. You know, these mitochondria are my, my metabolically active, so they actually will break down the fat and turn it into heat. It can happen pretty quickly because these kids, you don't want to have them get hypothermic because they've got a huge amount of surface area given their body so they can get hypothermic pretty easily. That's why I got to keep those kids in a blanket all the time to keep the little ICU cribs warm in the, or in the neonatal nursery. So if you biopsy a kid, and these are most commonly seen on the back, you biopsy the dorsal part of the back and you'll see brown fat there normally. This actually was just a tumor of it, totally benign. This was the first question on my exam in 1986, I guess it was, 85, 86. So that's, they, they show you this. If they showed it back then, they can show it today. So it can end up on your exam. Okay, very good. Well, what was the name of that again? Hibernoma, like hibernating. If you Hibernate. go by a bear in the middle of the wintertime, you're going to see lots of black, brown fat in a, in a hibernating bear. So this is a hibernoma. All right, good job, everybody. We will see you guys next month.